Fragment of Silicon. We talk about video games. Welcome to another installment of Fragments of Silicon. Um, I'm your host, Adam. Joining me, as always, is, well, two-thirds of the regular crew, since um, Petty Fan is currently laid up. He has had his knee surgery. Um, it was successful. It's just, uh, you know, he can't put any pressure on that for about four months. Mm -hmm. I'm like... I I'm sure we're, we're he'll hoping he'll yeah we're hoping he'll be able to come up with some way to use a computer in less than four months and I'm sure so is he. Yeah, I'm like he'll probably be back on audio sooner than that. Mm -hmm. You know, like he was. It's just you know he's gonna be out. You know, he's gonna be you know out for you know like uh, now technically he he actually doesn't know how long. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, apparently the doctor didn't tell him, uh, tell, tell him, but, you know, it's like uh, initial estimates were four months, mm -hmm. 12 weeks. So maybe we'll have an update on it. You know, it's like, you know, once again, he'll be back on audio sooner or later, mm -hmm. you know, probably mobile again. Anyway, that aside, uh, let's get to the news. Galax, you're first. Uh, well, I am packing today because we are the the local uh, geek convention, PortCon Maine, is this weekend, and by which I mean it starts tomorrow and ends Sunday. So uh, I'm actually preparing a little bit further in advance than usual, but it's still stressful because I'm also dealing with car stuff being a pain and some dental stuff on the horizon. So I guess I'm going to be trying not to spend too much money at a convention this time, which, yeah, that that sounds like a thing that works. <laughs> <laughs> it could happen. Uh, uh, anyway. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm going to be up to for the next few days. But uh, also, um, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night is finally out, and uh, while I've apparently been playing one of the two worst versions of it, because I've been playing on the Switch, which has... Uh, worse graphics and a little bit of input lag, but they have said they're working on that. But uh, it's generally been getting pretty good reviews, which is good because I backed it for a pretty large amount of money back in the when they were actually doing that, which I think was like four years ago. So uh, I've been playing that some, and that's been fun, even in the uh, kind of uh, clunky version. Mm. I do also have the PC version, but... Uh, fun thing about having a Switch is that you can carry it around, and unfortunately there's no way to put my save from the Switch version onto the PC version, so I'd be doing two completely different progression tracks. Indeed. Uh, and, anything uh, else? That's about all I got. Alright. Um, Twilight, your go. Oh. Alright, well, <clears throat> I'm finally on the final stretch of um, moving. Uh, I was expecting to be moved uh, um, sometime before today, but that got held up because um, the um, internet and phone company that I was going to be signed up with uh, needed some stuff from me before I um, before I could in fully initialize getting all the scheduling to meet with the people to get my stuff installed and whatnot. That'll be this Saturday, so I'm hoping be moved in Saturday evening or or a Sunday evening. Um well besides that, um it's been muggy here and uh you know packed up and 
That's about it. <laughs> All right, then. Um, yeah, news is moving at a rapid clip this week. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but, but no, I want I want details. Where where are you moving? How far away? Uh, what does it have to hmm. What does it have to do with gaming? Let's tie it in. <laughs> well, um, well uh, Twilight. Uh, well, you know, I'm going to be 20 miles away from where I'm currently living. It's, I'm moving into town for this convenience sake, basically. <laughs> Are y'all in Maine? No. no. We are in different locations. Yeah. He is in Kentucky. Yep. It's a, it's a modern and virtual world. Yep. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> yet, yet we still have to we still have to pack up and move, don't we? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, someday that will be over. <laughs> I'm like, believe me, the the day I don't ever have to move a couch again is the day I celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> like, anyway, um, moving onward. I guess it's my news. Uh, well, let's see. Um, good news. My mother has achieved a full recovery. Um, for those of you just tuning in, she's been suffering from bronchitis. For the past two months, like, and you know, still, you know, still recovering a little bit from you know just being sick. But you know, thankfully, she's you know doesn't have the actual disease anymore. So that's good for a uh, myriad of reasons. Um, let's see, and really, that's my big news for this week, which. Actually, um, quite the relief since it was kind of worrying there for a few. You know, it, mm -hmm. there was a chance that it could have morphed into pneumonia, which, you know, she, you know, she's nearly seventy, so that wouldn't have been good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so I think that'll about do it for the news. Um, so merrily we shall roll along on to the interview segment. And joining us this week is George, the Fat Man Sanger of Teen Fat. Hello. Hello. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing fine, and my mom is doing fine. Oh, that's good to hear. She's, uh, she's cooking up some tilapia um, that she just ah. got from El Pulpo across the bridge. And uh should be pretty good. She was. She offered to, to have me and uh, my wife join her uh, mm. for the tilapia. But uh, we opted out. I think we're going to go vegetarian tonight. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can understand. I don't really care for seafood myself. Oh. But, all right, um, geez. So, long and storied history here. Um, but we like to start by asking our guests um, this simple question. What got you interested in video games? Well, Adam, video games, <laughs> because video games, and the alternative was actually doing my assignments. You know, it was college days. Uh -huh. uh, let's let's put me at uh, Occidental College in uh, in uh, L.A. in you know seventy five through seventy nine. And uh, the pinball room was just starting to sport these bizarre uh, consoles with, uh, you know, uh, oh gosh, the first ones were, of course, uh, Space Invaders and Asteroids. And then uh, I popped down to the grocery store nearby and, and discovered this thing called Missile Command, which completely fascinated me. Um, and I, I had been trying to, you know, get the band. Yeah, I, I always had a band, and uh, the goal was always to be the Beatles, the pioneers. You know, to make everything. You know, to change the world through music. And uh, I was just starting to realize that the Beatles had kind of chopped down all the trees in that forest. It was kind of hard to be a trailblazer. But this video game thing uh, was something that. Uh, you know, parents didn't understand, and and 
you know, it, it, it was something that, that you discovered all by yourself. It wasn't commercial. Nobody, you know, was was telling you about it anywhere. You just discovered it by yourself by walking around and uh, and by talking to friends. And so it was a lot of the characteristics that the old rock and roll had uh, back in the day. So it was uh, very different from what we have now in a lot of ways. And uh, the creativity of it and the abstractness of it and the fact that every game was very different from the other game, um, that really attracted me. And I just spent a lot of my time and quarters uh, kind of trying to get to the level of Pac-Man with the pies in it. I never made it. Mm -hmm. Um, that, so that, there, there, yeah, there you go. That was pretty much it. And I used to play pinball before that in high school. A lot of pinball. And uh, and that space space wars game. I think is it called space wars? That first one that was like like uh, asteroids. You know, rotate left, rotate right, thrust fire. Uh, uh, cool spacey cabinet. Um, like the one that was before Pong. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, that was space war. Space where, yeah, we had one of those at the local arcade, which was actually in the in the basement of the Hotel Dell, which is a very kind of a bizarre location for something like that. But there, there it was, very world's oldest or largest wooden building, uh, you know, a Victorian hotel that's here in my town, and it was down in the basement, and there was uh, a lot of pinball and space wars, and there you go. that's going to get anyone interested. I'm like, I suppose so. I'm like, um, and I, su I suppose building off of that, so how did you eventually, you know, like branch into video games? Oh, well, uh, uh, I was, uh, well, the band broke up, you know. Uh -huh. uh, we had some success in, uh, in Los Angeles in the early 80s, so that was quite a scene, you know, new wave and punk. Um, and, uh, you know, the band broke up, and I was trying a lot of different things, doing things. And uh, my brother's college roommate was Dave Warhol. Hmm. And he, I was chatting with him, and uh, he, and I found out he was doing, he was making games for television. And I said, look, I want to do that. I want to get involved in that. I said, uh, teach me what you can. I'll take out your trash for free. You know, I'll do whatever you need. I'll work for nothing. Just uh, get me in on this. And he said, well, you're a musician, aren't you? Well, I had a degree in music and I was in a band. So I said, yeah. And he said, well, I need some music. I need a 10-second tune for Penguin's Ice Skating. And so I said, I can do that. And so I did. And uh, there's, there's more to that story, but that's a good place to cut it off. <laughs> uh, uh, why is there details that you can't go into or oh no not really i just don't know how long you want me to ramble on that one there's a lot a lot we can cover uh, well just real quick uh -huh. um i i played guitar into a four track recorder you know uh -huh. over and over again it w and uh uh once i got something that sounded the way that i wanted it i copied that down onto a manuscript paper like music and uh, -huh. uh gave it to Dave, and he turned it into code. That got into the game Thin Ice. Um, that right. was 1983. And he uh, uh, mentioned it to his boss, who I think I think might have been the late uh, uh, Keith Robinson, uh, who later bought the Intellivision name. Now, now tell me, tell Rico has it. Um, but uh, mm. they 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 took it to the boss, and the boss said, "No, we he can't do that for free. We he, we've got to pay him." So they said, how much how much should we pay him? So I I think I now I can't remember the number, but I think it was like twelve hundred bucks or you know somewhere around thousand bucks. So I was getting a thousand bucks for a ten second song, which is pretty good money per hour, you know, if if you if you imagine that you could actually play it in ten seconds or compose it in ten seconds, but. Uh, they uh, they paid me, and then they went out of business. I don't know if there's a causal relationship there, um, um, but probably, it was the, probably not. Given that it was the year 1983, and you know the, the whole yes. industry was crashing around. Yes. Well, you see, I noticed that at my next gig, 
was for uh, you know what was was for uh, uh -huh. Paul Edelstein. Um, I did uh, an interactive soundtrack for um, Capture the Flag, which was the follow-up to Way Out. And that was running on the Atari 800 and some other little platforms like that. I, I used an Atari Music Composer cartridge uh, <laughs> to write that one. Uh, but, you know, being on the Atari 800, uh, Sirius Software, they petered out and they paid me a, a fraction years later. Um, after a lot of badgering um, for what I for for, for that work, um, but that was again you know that was the great game crash in 1984 just following me around, and then the next gig was uh, doing a what was going to be the demo cartridge for Atari so for Atari 800. So they were going to play set up an Atari 800 in a store. I can't even remember what kind of stores they set those up in, and uh, it would play this cartridge, which would play this demo over and over again for the poor you know customers mm -hmm. and uh and so i was right i was doing some music for that and you know and right around then the atari crash happened and it got sold and, and it was reorganized and mm -hmm. and and you know that was it for a while <laughs> i came back to it when dave warhol resurfaced uh don't remember what year that was around when uh you know dick tracy and and total recall were coming out on Nintendo platforms mm. and hired me for those. Oh. And it was a lot cheaper than the thousand bucks for the 10 seconds by then. I think it was like forty nine ninety five for a tune. Oh, I'm like, yes. huh? That's quite a decrease. Yes. Yes. Well, I, I had, I run into some, uh, you know, uh, times, times can be, uh, Times can be affluent and they can be non-affluent. At that time, it was fairly non-affluent, but I caught on to some things. I found that I was able to produce music using MIDI, the kind mm -hmm. of a new thing. And uh, and so I was doing that for, like, uh, karaoke for music teachers and things like that and, and uh, original songwriters. And uh, I, I decided, well, to get customers, I'm going to start, like, at twenty nine ninety five a tune. And uh, when I get too busy, I'll raise my rates. <laughs> Uh, so that's it. There was a there was a guy named Earl Scheib who used to you know paint paint your car for forty nine ninety five, and uh, you know one of these late night TV ads, and uh, I I decided I'd be the Earl Scheib of music. So I was that, and I think I was around forty nine ninety five for a song when uh, when Dave started working with me. Um, now, did you use a, like an Atari ST to make MIDI music? You know, my first couple, I think I used an Atari ST, but uh, by the time uh, by the time I was doing it for for video games, the rig, if anyone's really interested, uh, was a a Mac. Mm. Uh, I don't think it was a plain vanilla Mac. I think it was uh, you know a couple of steps up from that, and uh, I had uh, Mark of the Unicorn Performer playing on that. And I was writing to MT32. MT now, there was no such thing as general MIDI. MIDI. I was like introducing the concept of MIDI into the, what do they call it? The, the workflow uh, of video games. So people were not using MIDI. I was kind of, kind of a, you know, I had sort of discovered it for video games, you might say. I mean, other people probably were discovering it too, but in my circles, uh, you know, I was I was the hip MIDI guy. Actually, we're working in a recording studio back in L.A. Uh, you know, when we used MIDI around that time, or around uh, you know 1980, 81, it was so exotic that we actually had to have the MIDI guys come over to the studio and explain how to use the MIDI. So we had Jim Mothersbaugh, who was the brother of the the guys in Devo, and he would mm. come over and. Uh, walk us through how to hook up those cables and stuff. But I'm skipping back and forth. Anyhow, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of how this, the thing started with uh, Dave Warhol. Mm -hmm. um, and I did a lot of a lot of tunes with him. Really enjoyed that. So he, he, he gave me that start at the beginning, and then he gave me my restart uh, in Nintendo. Uh, and uh, Go ahead. Well, um, creating music for the Nintendo, um, 
fairly notable for being a limited device. I think, what, three, four sh- sound channels? Two boops, a beep, and a <laughs> Yeah, that, that's about some things. I mean, did you find it all that constraining to make music for the NES? Not a bit. I found it, uh, I found it liberating. Um, I found it very, very uh, elegant and very fun to do. Um, you know, did, did you ever build like popsicle stick bombs? You know how you can like weave po- five popsicle sticks together and make a, you know, make them stay without any glue? Never actually done it, but I'm familiar with the general idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, um, it's elegant, you know. You get a number of popsicle sticks, and you know what you can do with them, and once you've tried a few possibilities, you're pretty sure you've exhausted the possibilities, and you know when you're done. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it felt like that. It felt like, uh, well, um, you know, I, I've got to express a basic musical idea, and I want to do it as, I want to, you know, pull in as much groove and coolness as I can, uh, you know, from my memory of how my favorite music goes. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I was able to, I'd, I'd be able to inject some of that, and I'd go, well, how far can I go in flushing this out? And uh, at a certain point, you go, well, that's that's about all I'm going to get out of this. Mm-hmm. And then I would, I would, so I'd make these little four-voice MIDI files, and I'd uh, throw them over to Dave Warhol, and he would take the MIDI and actually transform that into code. So MIDI never really got used in the games. Um, he just used it. We just used it as a way for me to get my ideas to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and later on, general MIDI became a thing in a little game called The Seventh Guest. Indeed. Uh, yeah, I believe it was the first general MIDI game mm-hmm. ever. Um, but, uh, that, uh, you know, that was after my having done, uh, a, a number of games, you know, to where I, I, I'd done Loom and, and Wing Commander. And, right. uh, I, the way I remember it, I got a call from, uh, and I was like speaking at, uh, the computer game developer conference and things like that. And then, uh, uh, I got a call from, <laughs> this is a, a, telephone call um, from Graham Devine, who was one of the co-producers of The Seventh Guest, and uh, he was very respectful, and he was like, can't believe I'm talking to the fat man, the guy who did Loom and Wing Commander, and, you know, of course, for a minute there, I, I bought into that. I thought, <laughs> wow, yeah, he is lucky to be talking to me. But once I once I saw, you know, that famous shot that you showed just earlier of the... Uh, uh-huh. You know, running up the stairs, right? You know, just just that shot up the stairs. I'm like, oh man, I am very lucky to be a part of this. Um, so yeah, he put me on that. Uh, I was thinking, well, I'm going to have to write this music, you know, a different version for every single kind of sound card. And in that, while I was musing about that, to my friend Tom White, who worked at Roland, oh, there's the shot. Oh, missed the stairs. Then. Uh, uh, Tom said, well, why don't you use this new thing called General MIDI? I said, well, what is that? He says, well, you just write for a sound canvas. And then it'll sound the same on all sound cards that use General MIDI. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll do that. So I, so I did it. Um, and, and the idea was to save myself work. Um, and I created General MIDI-ish sound sets for... The Roland MT32, which was the other high-end sound card, mm-hmm. and for um, FM, you know, Sound Blaster and stuff. So, right. so you play these tunes on any of those, and then the idea was we were going to wait until you know other general MIDI sound cards came out. Well, they they did, but they didn't really sound good, and so I ended up creating Fat Labs to certify all the general MIDI sound cards that would come out because it was just really kind of a mess. Um, but uh, eventually we certified enough sound cards and uh, we uh, talked to the, you know, the, the, the trade organizations. Finally, you know, after a lot of struggle, we talked them into using this, uh, you know, using our standards, which were based on the sound canvas uh, as 
a way of balancing the the tones against each other so that music composed on one instrument would sound good on another. So uh, so that was kind of a, a struggle and a triumph. And, of course, uh, it kicked in and became official right when General MIDI stopped being used. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but uh, for a minute there, you uh, couldn't sell a chip to a Taiwanese sound card manufacturing company unless it had the fat seal of approval on it. Hmm. <laughs> we had a, we had them, we had them where we wanted them, boys. Yeah. Like, ah, oh God. <laughs> and a grip on the industry, but we forgot to squeeze. <laughs> oh well. I'm like, uh, to be fair, it was. How do I put this? Quite wild westy. It was uh, very wild westy. Yeah. Like very very. And and you know what was fun was, um, I had no idea what other people were doing. You know, I mean, they, all you had was like Computer Gaming World magazine, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there there were BBSs, um, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, for the most part, you end up, uh, you know, you just go to the computer game developer conference every year and talk to people and then you read your computer gaming world magazine and that's how you knew what was going on so i really thought that i was uh, the first person doing things and i'd occasionally think i was the best person doing things and you know it, you, you you it was fun a fun chance to let your ego run wild oh ego isn't that the name of the the first person character and uh Seventh guest. Now that I think of it, mm -hmm. uh, you think so? <laughs> it, is. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. Yeah. So ego got to run wild, and uh, that was really fun for a while, and and energizing for my particular the way my brain works. Uh -huh. You know, I I uh, my, my parents lavished praise on me, and and uh, I sort of thought the world of myself. Um, so uh, so having an industry where I could be the hot shot uh, felt really good to me motivated me and I think it caused me to do good work and hopefully it didn't cause me to run over other people too much or speak unfairly about them too much uh, you know I tried tried to make friends and be kind and, and eventually in the process I, I started to discover what was going on in Europe and Japan and uh, it eventually became very humbling um, and uh yeah, you know, really kind of an interesting thing for me is I don't know how people do it these days without, you know, if, the, if you know all the stuff that's going on all around the world, it's very hard to feel like you're a, a, a big fish in any kind of a pond. Um, you know, you know the expression, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. a big fish in a small pond. A yeah, big fish in, in, a, in any kind of a pond. It's, it's hard to be ever feel like you're ever going to be even in the top 5% of anything. You know, there's just so much going on that you're exposed to, and I don't know if that's the natural. You know, I think you can you can maybe be the best at music in your crew. You know, if you've got a crew or a community, um, then there's that sense that you're the sound guy or you're the streaming guy or you're the interview guy. And by guy, I mean any gender. Right, right. It, it's like, well, I. S I suppose, like, yeah, the breakdown kind of starts, um, you know, we're talking modern day, you know, AAA and downward. I mean, you know, if we're talking about, like, today's high-budget video games, then, you know, we've got composers on the level of movie m makers these days. <laughs> yes. Like, we, yes. And, 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 you know, I, I always I try to say, you know, just because movie music is movie music doesn't mean it's good music. It doesn't say something's movie-like, but but uh, I, at this point, I cannot believe the incredible quality of the composers that we that that are writing for games. And now, at at what I had thought was that my guys, having introduced like the first John Williams impersonations in gaming, you know, which would be Wing Commander, we were, we were the first to do that insidious thing that became the only thing that anybody did for a while. Uh, and, and I thought that uh, when the time came that the technology allowed it, that we would be invited, we would get our chance to do uh, the orchestral stuff. 
but what happened was uh, we, you know, the industry hired people who were doing movies. And uh, the, the draw was to do things that were movie-like. So things were movie-like long before they were really good. You know, now they're really good and movie-like. But, uh, I, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's some I, really bad stuff that was like orchestral. I'm like, I could definitely agree to that. Like, yeah. Um, but, anyway, um, getting back to, you know, like the early 90s, yeah. um, you also worked on Loom. Which is an interesting one because that's, you know, that's actually adaptations of classical music. I was gonna yeah. say, isn't that the one with the music puzzles that some people just that like? Well, I forget if it was you or Naka Adam that just couldn't at all. Um, I don't recall offhand. Like, I mean, no, uh, no, no. That it, it, it might be, but but uh, they were musical and graphical. You could follow the. Yeah, you could follow it, uh, you know, with color and and location. I think you had this wand, and you like tap along the wand. Isn't that right? And and yeah, uh, play tunes. Yeah. Doesn't Ocarina of Time do that too? Is it, you have to uh, play some tunes to catch, cast spells. Sort of, but Ocarina of Time isn't actually music based well, in the sense uh, that I mean, it kind of is. Well, in the but sense you, that you have you to, only you only learn. The main thing about Ocarina of Time is you only learn a few number of songs. You can't use them before you get them, and you can always look them up whenever you need them, so you never have to, like, remember anything or figure anything out by sound. All yeah, right. it's like, yeah, yeah, it's like Loom... The thing about Loom is it had different levels of difficulty. You know, it's like if you played it on medium or easy, you'd have, you know, the, the, the music bar there. But it oh. was... It was hard mode, where you actually had to play it by ear. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have done that. I was playing with my parents. Oh, but that was fun. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, the uh, Loom was, uh, that was uh, Brian Moriarty, who mm -hmm. stayed a good friend. And I want to go back and, and say uh, uh, Graham Devine stayed one of my closest friends in the industry. You know, the, the, the co-producer of Seventh Guest, but we'll probably get back to that as we chat. Um, but uh, Brian Moriarty is also one of my, uh, you know, dear, valued friends. And uh, he's, uh, it was his idea to, uh, to use Swan Lake um, and to, to, on, on the MT-32, which was the state-of-the-art sound card. And so my, and he sent me the manuscripts for those for those uh, seven movements of that uh, of that piece. So my giant innovation uh, w which seems kind of small now but but really hit the spot was that a anything that was MIDI um, back then just usually ticked right along, you know, ding, 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 ding. You know, it was just like, bunk, gum, bunk, gum, bunk, gum, bunk, up. The tempo was always the same, and the, the, song, the notes were always the same volume, um, and it was just really mechanical. And so what I introduced, I think, or, or at least uh, did in a significant place, was that I uh, varied the tempo a lot, and I varied the dynamics a lot. And... Uh, to be perfectly honest, I did that by uh, by borrowing the dynamics and the tempos from a performance of those pieces by Seiji Ozawa mm -hmm. in the uh, L.A. Phil, I think. So um, the idea is um, any MIDI of Swan Lake before that would have gone bang, 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 and uh, imitating, you know, just like tap tempoing along with Seiji Ozawa and, uh, and listening to his balance and adjusting my balance, it would be more like dun 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 so, so, you know, it's, it's really varying and really emotional that way. 
Is that so, hard to do with MIDI? Uh, I, the tool that I was using had a tap tempo, so it really wasn't that hard, but I had to be kind of meticulous. Um, and, uh, you know, very, you know, I, I had to dive in and really correct things when they didn't sound right. And, uh, but no, the tools were right for it. Um, and it was pretty efficient work. Uh, the most difficult part, I think, was keeping track of what I had done and hadn't done as far as entering the parts, as far as how far I'd gotten. I think somewhere in, my, in, uh, in the archive, uh, okay, so the George Sanger papers exist at the University of Texas Center for American History uh, video game archive and at, in the Briscoe Center, and it goes on and on, all these descriptors. Um, but there's somewhere there's a chart of, uh, you know, horizontally it's listed all the, each movement, and then vertically it's listed, you know, have I entered the MIDI? Have I, you know, have I entered all of the MIDI? Have I double-checked the MIDI? Have I entered the instrument numbers? Have I entered the, you know, have I double-checked the, uh, um, you know, the volumes? Have I, have I balanced the volumes? Um, you know, have I put the headers on it? So, so it's kind of like a checklist for all those movements. So just being being meticulous that way, it's not, no big deal. It, it, it's just a tiny fraction of what people do now, but because it was new and because I was inventing it, it felt very challenging. Um, and uh, but I'll tell you, frankly, it was fairly easy to raise the bar, especially when you're ignorant um, of what else that was really good <laughs> might be out there. Um, but uh, I, I do feel like, uh, yeah, uh, Loom was a beautiful, beautiful piece, and, and it, it did raise the bar on a number of levels, and... Uh, I was allowed to be in the right place at the right time, and there was really kind of nothing else like it at the time, sonically. Yeah, I'm like, as an adventure game, there's still really nothing like Loom. So, <laughs> like, well, I'll tell Brian you said that. Indeed. Like, yeah, I think that's true. You know, a fun fact of uh, Brian, he, 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 uh, he gave a talk a couple of years ago, um, you know about uh, about Loom, and uh, he showed this incredible picture of his 21st birthday, where he's taking his first legal drink uh, at Lucas Arts. You know they were set up at Skywalker Ranch, and uh, mm -hmm. he uh, he showed a picture of himself. He had broken into uh, the cabinet and gotten out the uh, the prop that was the Holy Grail for the. <laughs> <laughs> for the Raiders, you know. The, the oh, wow! He took his first his first legal drink out of that. <laughs> I, I hope he didn't like wash it and damage it, you know, before he put it back. I, that would have been total sitcom fodder. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's the kind of thing you did back then. Uh, I suppose so. Like, now, are we just playing a video here, or are we actually solving the heart puzzle at, in real time? It's a recording. Um, yeah. Oh, I shouldn't have asked then. <laughs> so you're doing fine. a great job of solving that, but it looks like it's a little hard for you right now. We actually do it live, <laughs> usual, or we we had usually done it live well, because Petty Fan can't record, but Twilight can, so he's been doing that so he can focus more on basically, other stuff too. Yeah, basically what's on the screen depends on who's handling the stream. Yeah. So, um, anyway, um, yeah, getting back to the seventh guest, um, um, what was it like working with CD technology? Like, you know, having that jumping capacity from, you know, floppy disks, cartridges to, you know, the 700 megabytes of... Uh, of data that was encoded on a CD. Well, it would have been nothing to me at the time, except for except for one thing. So, uh, you know, until I opened my big mouth, it was just the same as working on anything else. You know, the visuals were taking advantage of the uh, of of all the room. Um, but for me, it was just like, well, there was a lot of music to do in the game, but really not that much, and and uh, you know, not very different from Loom. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I was so eager to be all in on this thing once I saw those stairs, you know, that uh, I said, hey, Graham, what's, the, you know, the CD-ROM? I said, is it like a CD? And he goes, yeah, yeah, it kind of is. It's a little different. I said, can I give you like 20, 40 minutes of like real music <laughs> as opposed to the fake music I've been doing mm-hmm. um, that you could like, I mean, would you be able to like play it like a CD? And he says, I don't know. I'll have to check. So we had to call in the big CD experts um, and uh, it, it just so happened we we knew one, uh, Bill Volk, and more on him, I guess, later. He was a, he was a big part of my, um, uh, he, Bill Volk uh, actually likes to say that he's, he's proud of two things. He discovered the, uh, the Miller brothers who, who went on to do uh, Mist, and, uh, and he, then he says he discovered me because, uh, because he gave me my first high-tech job. Uh, uh, but uh, he resurfaced, and he had become quite, quite an expert in CD technology. And, and uh, he told them, and he he was ready to advise them uh, on the CD-ROM thing. But anyway, we ended up doing uh, that extra album, you know, disc one, the game, disc two, the music. And I think that it was some kind of first, although I have a little trouble putting my uh, finger on it. It was the first general MIDI game. I've never heard any different than that. And uh, and it was the first. Uh, you know, game to include its own soundtrack in digital uh, in the game. And there were two tunes that played digitally within the game. Um, there's the intro uh, tune, you know, that plays over that uh, lightning flash in the house on the hill. Right. And then there was, uh, at least supposed to be, and I think it happened, uh, there was that Mister Farah Astaroth uh, choral thing, which I, I called... Uh, what did I call that? I can't remember the name of it. Uh, um, Chapel Pain, I think. Um, but uh, that's supposed to happen when you get uh, to a certain point in the game where you know a, a great big magical chant happens um, when you cast some kind of a spell or invoke some uh, uh, some black magic. Uh, so those those were the kind of the two digital points, you know, digital audio within the game. That might have been. S- Sort of a first. That actually, you know, little bits of A-bit audio had, had snuck into uh, other games. But this might have been the first uh, where you're playing CD audio at the same time during the game. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that was the main difference. And also just being part of something that was so uh, glorious in its scope. Indeed. It's... Once again, one of those things that's kind of lost time since, um, like, the seventh guest hasn't aged the best in terms of its graphical fidelity, uh, but such is well, the mark of progress. Yeah, well, at the time, um, it was so far ahead of anything else that, uh, you know, when, um, when Graham would show it at trade shows, uh, it, it was really uh, disturbing to him. People refused to believe that he was actually doing it, and they were always accusing him of faking it. So he would show you know, the game actually playing real time, and uh, people would look under the table uh, to, for, the, for the videotape player. Huh. Um, they, were, they were so sure that he was, he was doing this impossible stuff. Um, and, uh, it was all really, and, and I had, I had gone to USC film school, so I was kind of a film buff and a little bit of a snob and, uh, you know, looking at the, the acting and the script and stuff like that, I always felt like I had a lot to contribute to it. And also being, you know, uh, thinking so much of myself at the time, I thought, well, I could save this thing. I could save the day. I'll save the picture by giving them advice on their script. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'd, ex- I'd, give suggestions to Graham, and he'd say, well, that's okay, we've got this really great compression algorithm. I'm like, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about acting, I'm talking about storyline, I'm talking about... And 
you know, when it came out, it was so well received, and it it looked so kind of funky and cool and great compared to what else there was, that I, I'm just like, you know what? This is all about the compression algorithm. That that is the art that we're dealing with, and for <laughs> its time, it kicked butt on everything else. Oh, indeed. I mean, this game's this game was. Um launched the CD-ROM on computers. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, you know that the statistic is that uh, the, the biggest selling CD-ROM game before Seventh Guest was Sherlock Holmes Adventures. And uh, it, was, it sold like 20,000 copies. I'm like... And then, <laughs> and, and then Seventh Guest, you know, a million and a half copies right out of the gate. I, I'm like, King's Quest V was up there as well. Like, and then uh-huh. that sold uh, really well. Like, and then Mist came along and obliterated everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, you remember, <laughs> no, uh, you know, all respect to Mist. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what makes me giggle is that uh, the early boxes of Mist uh, had uh, a little sticker up in the corner that said, what did it say? Better than the seventh guest. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if I saw that um, personally, like, but I I could definitely see it was there since again the seventh guest was quite the phenomenon back uh, back in the day. Yeah, but Mist was so Mist was so huge that you know game developers couldn't even see it as a game. It was so, it was like looking at the. It's like looking at the sky, you know. They they just like that's not a real game. That's not a real game, and it was outselling everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, and yeah, apparently Miss is going to be a major motion picture or something now. <laughs> well, you know, Seventh Guest is going to be a yeah web series, right? And and yeah, and yeah. I actually I, I saw a uh, oh a year or two ago. You know, they're 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 always. There are always these little incidences where, you know, some uh, uh, film producer will look into the possibility of making Seventh Guest a movie. And I actually saw something come across my desk, and I had to put put a film producer in touch with Rob and the gang. Um, I don't know whatever came of that, but at some point, Seventh Guest will be a, uh, will be a movie, too, I expect. Um, uh, and, and it'll be hilarious and great. Well, with the... Um, continued proliferation of streaming services, um, it's probably just an eventuality. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and now, now uh, let me ask you guys, you know, you talk about it not, uh, hmm? not, you talk about, uh, you know, how it, how the Seventh Guest is aged. Yeah. I've had this, I, it just seems to me that in its weird way, uh, it's actually aged pretty well. If, if if you're looking at it funky, you know, if you're ready for a little, a little irony, not much. Uh, the puzzles are still hilarious. Yeah, I guess the, sto- the, the story things. and the puzzles are fine. The mm-hmm. main things that have aged a little are the graphics and to ex- to an extent the video quality for the FMVs and the fact that they're FMVs. But mm-hmm. that's not really that bit much of a deal since I mean. I was reading about the game, and that's why they made them ghosts in the first place, is because of the the video quality of the FMVs. So, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, because that was like what they had, yeah. But uh, yeah, are, but I seem to see people keep getting pumped about it, and and they get in that nostalgia thing, and it's sort of like, uh, I mean, what I'm seeing. I mean, tell me if you agree with me, but uh, what I see is that, that that people like it sort of the way they like eight bit. Yeah, um, there's there's a little bit of I mean not quite as much because I feel like the 18-bit 16-bit graphic style yeah got elevated to a form that was pretty much perfectly that uh without really changing to something else which is why a lot of early like 3D polygon games felt super clunky whereas a lot of the stuff from this kind of 3D game 
uh -huh. pretty much evolved into either actual full FMV games that were like using live action stuff or like <laughs> full 3D games that were with better quality 3D. Like pre-rendered stuff was always pretty much felt like it was almost cheating trying to be better than technology could do with it like it was a reach right <laughs> yeah so that that's why i feel like there's probably a little less for a lot of the pre-rendered style 3d stuff and um fmb stuff well let me ask you something straight out are you guys going to play the new uh the the new the new stuff um in terms of what exactly like isn't there personally, a, the, the, personally, the new edition yeah the, um, like, what, of the seventh guest? Seventh guest. Oh, Personally, that's the... there's a decent chance. Um, for that's the show, the... it'll depend if we get uh, codes for it. That's usually our show policy. Well, it's like, <laughs> well, if you're talking about the 25th anniversary, we've already played that. Ah, right? there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, uh, because, uh, you know, it's like the new thing that uh, Trilobite's doing is the board game. Uh, you guys are pumped to that on, on that, huh? That uh, actually, yeah, that actually looks pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's just you know we aren't able to play that since that's a physical board game and we are you know in different states. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh no, oh the best laid plans. Uh, you yeah. know what? If we could just take a physical board game and turn it into an uh, electronic thing somehow. <laughs> Oh wait, I'm like it, it can be done. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, no, there are there are decent online board game yeah. versions and some and, some even like console stuff. But well, it's like and there's also you know companies like Small World or Asmodee Digital. You know they make digital versions of board games. It's just you know Trilobite. I don't think has the resources to do like a digital board game of their uh, board game yet. <laughs> Maybe that'll be next. Possibly. I'm like, you know, they, they seem to be focused on um, getting the expansion packs to that said board game out currently. You know. yeah. um, anyway, um, we'd be remiss if we didn't ask, um, you know, in regards to the 25th anniversary remaster, did you have any part in that? Uh, no, I really didn't, but I'm, I'm really enjoying sort of doing little co-promotions and, and uh, uh, you know, trying to make the soundtrack, uh, uh, you know, uh, available, you know, let people who have, have the game know that the, uh, you know, if they want to take the, the sound, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to their, to the car, you know, they can, they can stream it, they can, they can uh, download it. Right. Um, and, and the place to look for, and, and I, I want to, just be encouraging to my friends at Trilobite, uh, and uh, and be supportive um, of of what they're doing, and uh, encourage people to check it out. And then, you know, for my part, what can I contribute? You know, uh, I'm hoping to, uh, you know, to maybe sign a few uh, a, f a few old CDs. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, in regards to that, uh, when you get your 25th anniversary. Um, you know, you'll 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 get that same great sound, um, and uh, I guess some kind of remastering, which I actually didn't didn't check out. And but uh, uh, how how wrong could it go? It was already pretty good. Um, and then uh, you know, if you want to take it with you to play the board game, um, you know, go to, just just look for it. the place to look for it. Is it's usually called Seven Eleven Seven Slash Eleven. But if, if you Google for the Fat Man and Team Fat, or you look right. on iTunes, or Bandcamp is really a good place to to download it. So go to Bandcamp, look for the Fat Man and Team Fat, and the and the, the disc is 7-Eleven, and it, it's a good soundtrack album. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm partnering up with the Materia Collective, who does a lot of fan-oriented um, music releases. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so there may be some treats and special editions coming out in the future but uh, the the main point is I'm proud to be associated with this game I'm proud to be associated with uh, 
uh, with Trilobite. I, I'm, you know, I'm glad I'm still in touch with uh, with old Rob. You know, we've had some good times in the past. He put out an album of mine once. He, I mean, he actually did the the album art for it, um, which was really cool. Oh, you know, funny. Come to think of it, uh, when I actually put out the the Seven Eleven soundtrack, my record company was Brian Moriarty, the Loom guy. <laughs> He'd always, wanted to, he'd always wanted to be a record company, so he became one. Huh. Um, but I'm, 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 you know, I'm happy to know all these great guys who've done so much for games, and and uh, you know, like I said, uh, uh, Graham comes back into the picture. I talk to him every couple of weeks. Uh, he got me uh, my gig doing that uh, augmented reality company, uh, mm. Magic Leap. So, right. He got me in as their uh, first sound hire, and and I got to do some amazing things on that team. Um, so that was that was super great. So these are these are wonderful uh, people, uh, you know, who are at their best, uh, especially for the time, um, mm-hmm. doing doing this game. So I guess that sounds a little uh, sounds a little sycophantic, doesn't it? But uh, I, mean, I like my friends. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You gotta, you, you know, you, prop, props, props to the homies, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> you know, these are these are good people, and I, I, I want to say good things about them publicly. <laughs> no doubt, no <laughs> even doubt. if it's awkward. <laughs> well, I mean, especially they, if it's awkward, it's funnier that way. Yeah. Uh, do they, have they expressed awkwardness towards it? Oh, I, uh, awkwardness towards, uh, or just uh, like say, I, I'm just a. Uh, uh, the awkward. They, they, no, they've been great. They were they were beautiful. I mean, Charlie was really kind to me, and and uh, uh, Rob always has been. And and uh, Graham, geez, Graham introduced me when I got an award one time, and I thought I was being buried. He was so kind. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, no, no, no. The only awkwardness is when it's funny when you're saying something uh, nice in a in a forum like this where it's a little more comfortable to be cynical. <laughs> and, and snarky. Uh, I, I actually just would rather just open my heart and say, you know, these are great people. Yeah, indeed. Uh, anyway, um, shifting a bit, I suppose we should ask about <coughs> your moniker. Um, you know, how did you get the name the Fat Man? Uh, I was talking to my. I, I moved to Austin, Texas, mm-hmm. after having acquired certain you know, really impressive sounding credits um, in Los Angeles recording studios. And I thought I was going to be a recording producer, and I thought that I was going to uh, be the hotshot when I moved to Austin. I was going to, um, you know, tell people, yeah, you can mic the bass drum that way if you want it to sound bad. And uh, I was going to put my feet up on the desk and say you'll never work in this town again and smoke a big cigar. I was going to be fat man of Austin and I told this to my brother uh, <laughs> and you know it never happened and uh, well, it happened in a different way but he started calling me fat man uh, and the name stuck and it actually worked very well for me at the time um, and people would get sort of intimidated picturing this you know giant imposing show business uh, mogul um, and then it would turn out you know as they got to meet me that I would basically be a lot nicer than they were expecting and so uh, relationships became uh, a matter of increasing comfort and increasing fun and increasing uh, kindness and love and I liked it like that so uh, the fat man stuck oh. Neat. and that's the real story <laughs> I'm like as opposed to the embellishments as opposed to the embellishments, yeah, for a while I'd just make stuff up. You know, I'd say, well, I was supposed to be the, the fast man, but there was a misprint on my business card, so I just had to call myself what, what the card said. Couldn't afford to reprint, you know. Right, right. And um, tell us a bit about Team Fat. Ah, oh, more great guys. Well, uh, the, 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 the short version of it is, uh, you know, I, these guys came into my life in Austin, uh, one at a time, um, and uh, they were my best friends, and they were uh, 
incredibly talented, and uh, I based a lot of my reputation and success on their good work. Um, Joe McDermott, uh, who's still doing music, uh, a lot of it is for uh, children in, in Austin, Texas. Uh, Dave Govett, uh, our main sort of orchestral guy, wing commander guy, uh, brilliant on a lot of levels. A lot, a lot of levels, and he's uh, he's a cop now in uh, in Austin. Um, he found that it was a lot less stressful to face an armed <laughs> perpetrator than it was to face your email of people delivering high pressure deadlines. Uh, uh, Kevin Phelan um, was just the the heart and soul of the whole thing. Um, you know, very East Texas. Uh, slow-moving anti-technology. It was, you know, he ran Fat Labs, but he kept our feet on the ground as far as, you know, what's better, riding a horse or working a computer? And it was always riding a horse. And uh, he seems to have uh, vanished. I haven't, we haven't heard from him in, in years, but, uh, you know, I, one of the things I learned is you just don't, don't worry about Kevin. You know, I just learned that lesson over and over again. And uh, it's funny, Joe, I talked to Joe a couple of weeks ago, and he said that he had talked to Dave Govett uh, the week before, and uh, the question of Kevin came up. And uh, Joe said, have you heard anything from, from Kevin? And Dave said, no. I said, I haven't. I said, but, uh, you know, funny thing, uh, last time I saw him, he was reading a book called How to Disappear. <laughs> so, <laughs> he's probably just fine. Um, and uh, if he's listening, I, I send him all my love and uh, wish him the best to uh, to stay gone if that's what he wants to be. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, but uh, but he's welcome well welcome to visit anytime. Uh, oh, that's good. What a, great, what a great team, and uh, you know we kind of wanted to, we kind of wanted to be the Beatles of uh, Beatles of video game music, and and I guess uh, you know we weren't the Beatles of. of of music, you know, the Beatles are the Beatles of music, but for video games, uh, we, we, we accomplished on our own scale. Uh, Maybe you were the... A lovely life and, and great innovations and, and uh, just had some beautiful, beautiful years. Mm. Maybe you were the Velvet Underground of, the, of video game music. Maybe we were. Maybe we were the Monkees. Yeah, we had a lot of that Monkees thing going on. I don't know if you guys watched that show, but we had the the crazy clubhouse, you know, the, the tree house where uh, anything could happen and mom and dad aren't coming home anytime soon. Uh, like, uh, I knew of the monkeys. I evaded them. I didn't like them growing up for whatever reason. You know, I liked a few of their songs, but I mostly didn't find out those songs were them until afterwards. Same here. Oh, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of their songs were helped out by the best musicians in the world. Um, mm hmm you know, the, the wrecking crew. Uh, but a lot of them, they did themselves toward the end. Uh, but anyway, monkeys, monkeys aside, it was a more, more just a, uh, a lifestyle goal, you know, to have, uh, have a little group of, uh, of buddies and, uh, do artistic things, uh, in a free and loving, uh, fun environment. And, uh, we, we lived like that, uh, a number of years and, uh, and I, I, I hope that that uh, permeated uh, our music, and I hope it brought joy to people, and I, I hope that other people, uh, you know, you don't have to exactly live exactly like that to get the joy of it, but uh, I hope we sent the message out there that uh, you can live a joyous and loving life, uh, even, even in this day and age. And you guys, I think, are sending a little bit of that message. Uh, I don't see too much of the corporate disease going on here. Uh, sounds like a, a little group of buddies who are doing what they love uh, in between uh, what has to be done. We try, yeah. And that, you know that 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 makes that that improves the colors that surround the world. You know, you're making the world a better place. You're mm -hmm. healing the planet, boys. It's certainly easier when you have only like five people total and like no money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it well, it's also, we've experienced, um, how, shall we say, the corporate review, or the corporate interview. That is not a thing I ever want to do ever again. <laughs> yeah, it, it's hard to 
even right. if people ha- like we understand that people have things they can and can't talk about and things they have to talk about for their pub- for their publicity purposes but people who like only stick strictly to talking points and stuff is always a little bit of a pain people oh. who are in a, who were inauthentic let's say like mm-hmm. who you just knew that they were marketers and that was it. I mean, uh-huh. mind you, you know, marketing happens all the time here. Uh, it's like, but it's like, and we've had people from big publishers on the show and they, you know, they try to retain their sensibilities, at least the people we've encountered. It's, it's, it's tricky, you know, uh, when I was working for Magic Leap, it was the world's most exciting startup and the world's most secretive startup. That's, you know, according to the cover story on Wired Magazine, right? So when it was time to speak uh, publicly, uh, it, it required a lot of thought to be able to come up with uh, things that I could say that still uh, not be violating my you know, the, the sort of trust pact that I have with everybody that I've known in my past and that, you know, and, and basically with human beings. So I wanted to be able to speak authentically and from the heart and still represent what I could and couldn't say, you know, legally and, and, and by, uh, by company policy. So some of those guys are going to be in that position, too, where they've got a message that they're under pressure to say or maybe their lawyers won't let them say certain things. Um uh, so, so my heart goes out to everyone who's got uh, corporate rules and who needs to speak. A lot of times it works. Um, and the people who can pull it off with authenticity, uh, my hat is off to them. And, and uh, that's a wonderful thing to do if you can do it. Mm, no doubt. And, yeah. geez, there's so much we could talk about, you know, just giving your history and such. Like... Um, but I suppose we should ask, um, what have you been up to lately? Uh, well, uh, I had a moment there. Oh, and let me just ask you for, for your own structure. Uh, uh, how much uh, time is left on the clock? Um, not a whole lot. Like, oh, okay. Well, good. That, that tells me how fast. Okay, so I'll talk really fast, and I'll, <laughs> I'll leave out everything that's important. Um, I mean, just, just recently... I got to do a couple of months on Oddworld Soulstorm. Mm-hmm. And uh, that is something that I would really like to tell you about and probably can't tell you too much about. Um, but uh, I have I have played some of it and enjoyed it immensely. And if you're any kind of an Abe fan... Or an odd world fan, uh, you will not be disappointed when it comes out. Uh-huh. Um, I believe that it is the biggest unity project that's ever been put together. So it's it's uh, on a massive scale. It's ambitious, uh, and it was really a gas getting to work with uh, Lauren Lanning, who actually is uh, the the crazy, <laughs> you know, charismatic genius that you would that he. Tr- sometimes comes off as, you know, he's got that reputation. He really we've is met, that guy. We have met Lauren Landing. We've actually had him on the show a few years ago, so this is true. <laughs> yeah, so you know that. Uh-huh. So I've been I've been to the secret lair, you know. Uh-huh. And uh at, it's it's a clubhouse. It's uh you know one huge room with all the you know, all the toys the boys like, you know. Mm-hmm. It's the pool table and the you know the s- snacks and huge, huge shelves with uh, incredible artifacts and you know books and art, art things and uh, uh, you know it's just like how you'd like your treehouse to be. And uh, and Lauren has uh, this amazing sort of dentist chair on hydraulics that he sits in. You know, it's a it's sort of a bionic, uh, you know, overlord's chair. Mm-hmm. Uh, with his monitors and, and things and uh, you know all the people within reach to do his uh, beck and call and respond to his uh, uh, response to his uh, dictatorial whims which usually are actually very, very 
very kind and and uh, uh, and usually very smart and and fun. Uh, but uh, they they things happen fast around there, and it's really fun to watch. Mm. I am very much looking forward to Soul Storm. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, so there's, there's been, so back to the lately, um, uh -huh. there's been, there's been Soulstorm and there's been, uh, interestingly, a little bit of, uh, songwriting. So I've been playing around on songsforgames.com mm -hmm. and I haven't been up keeping it that well, but I've been, but, uh, that's where my latest songs will be showing up. Um, I have been, uh, actually educating myself on the higher tech side of audio integration working on some slot machine projects um, and so it's like large scale small scale high tech low tech uh, fun corporate just everything but uh, you know it might be fun I, I've I actually uh, had a couple of encounters that haven't quite gone through but if you've got some indie game developers out there I think I'm in the mood to work on some uh, some indie games some retro stuff you know do a little uh a, a little quick work, you know, even on the, on those, on the indie budget, you know, <laughs> get in there and, and get back to my roots and, uh, you know, find me someone in, in your audience that wants to do a two boops, a beep and a, <laughs> <laughs> in the authentic style. Right. And I'm there for that. That, that feels like it would make me grin, you know? Well, so, I mean, let's well, put it out there. All right. I'm like, I mean, we have indie devs on the program all the time, so you know, if it comes up, we'll certainly yeah. mention it. Like, and that. you know, it's like, and we'd certainly like to have you back on the program at some point, since there's a lot here that um, we haven't covered. Yeah, yeah. Well, bring me back for the uh, humongous entertainment uh, <laughs> edition. I'm we'll, like, we'll do, we'll do some. We'll riff on putt putt. We haven't even brought that up. Well, I mean, um, I can. Let me see. I can schedule something right now if you want. Want? <laughs> well, not in front of your fans, but I don't. Do this yeah. is a thing that has happened many a time. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm like, oh. yeah, it's like real time. Real time booking has been a thing on this show before. You know? <laughs> um, let's see. We have an opening on July twenty fourth. Uh, July twenty fourth. Uh, just a second. This is real time booking. We're booking uh, <laughs> July twenty fourth. Uh, see, yeah, I think I could do that. All right. Um, so we'll have you back on the program then, and you know, yeah, we'll certainly talk about humongous entertainment. Okay. You know, among other things, I've been playing through some of their games. Wasn't there a big, uh, what, humble bundle for them recently? Yeah, there was. You know, it was like all of the humongous entertainment games were um, up for sale in one package. Mm. Like, um, mainly because the, the whole humongous entertainment set just got, like, Windows 10 compatibility or something like that. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, anyway... Um, George, it was lovely having you on the program. Um, it was lovely. It was yes. lovely, Adam and Twilight and the Gullix, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he is. So, I, it may, it, it, may I call you the? <laughs> Some people do. It's usually weird. But yeah, go you, ahead. May call, you may call me the as well. Fair enough. First name basis. <laughs> Some, sometimes <laughs> I joke about it being short for Theodore. It's not, but I joke about it. <laughs> okay, good. That's a that's a good one. That's a good one. And and try to you know try to get out of that con without buying uh, you know too much too much custom fan art. Yeah, um, I'll try. You can do it. And 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 give uh, Petty Fan our wishes for his knee. Tell him if you know if he can just resist typing or using the mouse with his knee. Uh, that's my diagnosis. That that that, that uh, that's my prescription. And I think that he'll get better a lot faster. That would be a good start. Mm -hmm. yes. right. Anyway, so that'll about do it for this installment of Fragments of Silicon. Um, the week ahead, um, well, uh, uh, in some scheduling news, Friday's interview 
has been delayed to next month since there were some um, authorization issues that have yet to be sorted out. Uh, that is still coming. It's just, it's going to be a bit longer than we anticipated. I'm like, um, anyway, um, coming up on the Sunday reviews. Let's see, we have reviews of Mach Super Space Taxi, One Screen Platformer, and The Red Solstice. And until then, I wish you good gaming. Bye-bye. Bye.